In episode eight, season two of Conversations with Musicians with Leah Roseman, I was honored to have the opportunity to speak to the inspiring creative force and conductor, Daniel Bartholomew Poyser. We explored many topics, including how he built his conducting career, LGBTQ rights, his concert with drag queen Thorgy Thor, his education project with singer Jamila called Reggae Roots, trains, planes, and automobiles, and the value of pursuing personal interests, the lost music of Florence Price, how to avoid tokenism while increasing diversity, and amazing advice not only for conductors, but for everyone about broadening your perspectives, using creativity to relax, and safeguarding your mental health. Daniel is currently the San Francisco Symphony Resident Conductor of Engagement and Education, the Artist in Residence and Community Ambassador at Symphony Nova Scotia, and the Barrett Principal Education Conductor and Community Ambassador of the Toronto Symphony Orchestra, as well as the Principal Youth Conductor and Creative Partner at the National Arts Centre Canada. This series is available in podcast form wherever you listen to your podcasts. Hi, welcome Daniel Bartholomew Poyser. You are an incredible conductor. You are a resident conductor of community and engagement with the San Francisco Symphony. Did I get that title right? Of, uh, com- I'm resident conductor of engagement and education. Oh, oh. see, <laughs> I knew I'd get it wrong. And with and similar titles with Toronto yeah. Symphony, Symphony Nova Scotia, and my very own National Arts Centre Orchestra. Uh, yes, <laughs> that's correct. And some of our listeners are Canadian and they'll be familiar with you or, the, or in the States, but many people are in other places and they, they don't know who you are. And um, so I really want to talk about, of course, the incredible documentary that was made about you, Disruptor Conductor, and we'll refer to other projects that Canadians hopefully will be familiar with. But we might go into some detail with that stuff because if people don't have a chance to see it or haven't seen that movie, um, it might be nice to go into some detail with that. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. I'd love to I uh, really admire how you're able to bring our art form to more people in so many different ways and very creative ways. And it's, I think it's really important that we need to get new audiences in to experience the symphony orchestra and all the things it can be. And you started in music education in a school band program, correct? With, correct. With the tuba. With the tuba, yes. And this made this accessible for your family, right? Because they had a tuba for you. You didn't have to... Absolutely. This mm-hmm. was the, this is one of the big things. If it had not been for the music education programs that existed in Alberta at the time, in Calgary at the time, mm-hmm. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. Because for, you know, the, the majority of my teenage years, it was a single, a single parent family. And my mom would not have had the money to purchase a tuba, probably maybe not to rent a full-size tuba, but I had the instrument to play on and I had the lessons at the school and I had the opportunity to play with other people at the school. So I received the benefit of the work done by really smart educators. Shout out to Vondis Miller, um, University of Lethbridge music music educators in Alberta that had a vision that uh, wanted it to be accessible. And then decades later, I get to have the benefit of that. And I hope that my work will in some way contribute to increased accessibility for young people to become involved, not just in listening to music, but also in performing, learning instruments, incorporating it, in, incorporating it into their regular lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I was just thinking, now I'm jumping ahead of where I wanted to be. You're also known as the host of an amazing show on CBC Radio. And what is it called? Center Stage? Yeah, to- <laughs> CBC Center Stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And in one of your episodes, you were talking about amateurs and professionals and how, of course, there used to be so many more people just playing music because that was the way to access music. And there was music written for them that was a little easier, mm-hmm. which is a really cool idea. And I was thinking about that in terms of accessibility now, because so many of our concerts have been shut down during this pandemic. But I do know a lot of people are taking up instruments they, they used to play. And there's this wonderful rebirth of that for a lot of people. It's been wonderful. And I think a lot of orchestras have tried to take advantage of the fact that people are playing or are playing instruments more now in their concerts, in their houses and having play along projects, mm-hmm. you know, play along with the orchestra, play along with the symphony. And you don't even need that. Something that I do that's a lot of fun is I will take uh, a piece of music, you know, on, on cello or whatever, and just play along, like, you know, download uh, off of a website, 
Schubert's Third Symphony or Second Symphony or, or especially if it's really fun sight reading stuff that I don't know, you know or like mm -hmm. a Haydn Thirty Fourth Symphony, right? Just sight read along with some fa famous orchestra and have a ball and look at their bowings and it's just fun. So we have all this access to be able to play music in this way, and I think we should take advantage of it. So yeah. It's been great to see people reconnect with their past selves, the younger selves that quit piano lessons before they should have. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm curious, so are you playing along with the piano or with your tuba? Oh, uh, cello usually. Oh, okay. Um, I didn't know. Yeah. I'm a, yeah, I'm a, I studied cello um, as a second instrument in university. Mm -hmm. Right. And then as a, I don't play along with tuba because that's, you know, that's, that's my professional yeah. instrument. Um, but sometimes I'll play along with, usually I'll play along with cello just like for fun to relax. Or at a certain point I was part of a cello ensemble or mm -hmm. like amateur string quartets, do stuff like that. So for me, that's still fun. Um, having these playing instruments at an amateur level is still fun um, in a way that it's not when you're professional, you know, because mm -hmm. you get so in your head about, is this right? I'm not playing as well as I used to. I need to be playing better. This audition is coming up, this or so, you know? When I, I like, there are instruments that I play only for me and that I will never, ever perform on because it's for me to mm -hmm. enjoy music and not worry about making a mistake in front of the audience or in front of the orchestra. No, I'm just going to play for myself and have fun. And I think that's something that is absolutely accessible to anybody who has, you know, you know $10 to buy a recorder. And some people don't have $10 to buy a recorder, right? Um, but I think that we definitely can start and we can have fun with music um on our own as amateurs and that there needs to be a revival of that and maybe orchestras have a bigger role than we've played in mm -hmm. sort of um in in encouraging that because we are you know the self-appointed purveyors of perfection right mm -hmm. and there is a place for that i believe there's a place for that there's also a place for whoops uh but we're still having fun and this is a this is a place to be um this is a place to to explore that. So mm -hmm. I think I think it's just both in balance. I'm going on now. Sorry, that was an interesting question. <laughs> That's super interesting. And so in Disruptor Conductor, which is um, a documentary about you and a lot of your outreach projects, it, your mom talked about how even when you were very young, like you wanted to conduct. So you did tuba. And then when you did your performance degree in tuba before you went and did conducting, I, I know you did education in there too, but were you thinking at that time, I want to be a tuba player in an orchestra or you always really wanted to be a conductor? Conductor. It was always okay. conductor. Um, and I don't know why, but I do know that second year university, I started that you know, set cello as a second instrument, mm -hmm. right? In the second year. Ta this, is, this is a funny story. Oh, you're going to love this. I do you know who my first cello teacher was? My very first cello teacher. You know them, Amanda Forsythe. Really? Was my, <laughs> exactly, Amanda Forsythe, former principal of National Arts Center Orchestra, former principal cellist of Calgary Philharmonic Orchestra, was my first cello teacher. So you have to picture the hilarity of this because I just wanted to become a conductor. So I went to my first lesson. I was like. And, and you know why I wanted to do cello is because I always saw string players doing vibrato, and I thought. <gasps> That looks so cool. Like I just wanted to vibrate. I wanted to do vibrato. I was like, this is amazing. So I get to my first lesson. I was just like, okay, I want to be a conductor. So I need to learn some things about string instruments. We had a ball. We had a we had so much fun in those lessons because she was used to, you know, working with players on these masterworks, blah, blah, blah. And then I would come in with my C major scale and she would literally sometimes have the teaching beginners book or be calling her friend who worked with beginners. And we would talk about music and talk about conducting. And we had a good time. We had a good time. She was um, she was a really wonderful teacher for even though she went, she didn't usually teach beginners, right? Mm -hmm. Because we were talking about music as much as about cello. Right. Yeah. It was really great. Um, and I'm, and I'm lucky actually, I'm lucky because it was really inspiring and I've, I haven't worked with her. Like since I've been a conductor, we haven't worked together yet. And one day we will. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but she knows all my, all my musical faults and it'll be, we'll have a, it'll be a ball. I look forward to that day. Yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah. So I'm curious about, um, I've heard you talk about in other interviews, how you had gone to um, Manchester, right, to do your master's. Yes. And then you were teaching. You were teaching high school for many years. But um, you had- I taught junior high school. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you had this burning desire to be a conductor. Yes. 
all along. And a couple of friends sat you down and said, you got to go for it. You have to try every opportunity you can. And I'm curious about those opportunities. Right. So was, those are um, two University of Calgary. They're now U of C professors. And before they were performers in Calgary and with the, with the Calgary Philharmonic Orchestra, Gareth Jones and Rod Squance, Dr. Rod Squance. And the, oppor- the main opportunity was the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra conducting symposium with Alexander Micklethwaite. And that was a conducting symposium. What was really interesting, really good about that conducting symposium was that they didn't just have all 10 or 15 of us come in, sit down for three days and dig into the or text of Brahms four and Beethoven nine and learn the pattern, think about balance and blend. No, they sat us down. They said, you have half an hour in your groups of three to come up with a symphony season for a mm-hmm. small orchestra and the instrumentation is two flutes, two oboes, two clarinets, two bassoons. Sometimes you'll get a third flute, uh, four horns, two trumpets. Do that. Come up with the whole season, right? Um, here's how you do an interview. Here's how you think about how they actually talked about the actual job of conducting, right? They had an agent from New York, from Despecker um, Management, Stephen Lugosi, come in and talk to us about what actually happens in conducting. So it kind of expanded my mind. At the end, I got to conduct Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra um, in the front final movement of Brahms IV, which is really important because it's a great movement. I used that audition tape for other auditions. Mm-hmm. That helped me get an audition with Vancouver Symphony Orchestra, right? I didn't win the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra audition, which, which was probably, I don't know, um, a year and a half later, but it got me in front of the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra, the biggest orchestra I'd ever connected to that point. On the Tuesday morning, of that week, I was conducting grade sixes and sevens and grade eights, right? Doing B flat major scale Wednesday morning in front of the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra. So that when I went to do my Thunder Bay Symphony Orchestra audition, I was used to being in front of bigger orchestras. On the Tuesday morning of that week, I was conducting grade sixes and sevens and grade eights, right? Doing B flat major scale. Wednesday morning in front of the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra. So that when I went to do my Thunder Bay Symphony Orchestra audition, I was used to being in front of bigger orchestras. I had gotten some of the the nerves, the jitters out, and I felt ready and I felt happy. So that Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra uh, conducting symposia was sort of the linchpin that helped me understand a number of things, understand the job, give me the opportunity, give me the footage that I needed to get to the next step. Mm-hmm. I've often thought we need more things like that in our profession. I think what we need is we're very singularly focused mm-hmm. on playing music perfectly, playing music to the best of our ability, right? Okay. But I do think there's room and space in our in, in our nurturing of younger performers. For help to help them from the very from the onset mm-hmm. have a broader and richer understanding of all the elements that are inherent to our profession and all the riches that are in them that they can bring to the profession and how they don't necessarily have to sacrifice um all of themselves to be in this that they can incorporate other aspects right again there is a place there's absolutely and there always will be and i hope there always will be a place right for the musician who is going to spend six hours a day making perfect oboe reads and then spending the other five practicing and then going audition. That is, that is part of what we do. There mm-hmm. is also a place for the crazy junior high teacher who does a bunch of auditions and then kind of morphs education and community outreach into conducting. There is a place for the Gustav Mahler orchestra conducting competition winner who is just a wunderkind and an incredible conductor and does all the you know there's a place for all of us right but it's the all of us that needs to be emphasized a little bit more mm-hmm. right the, the uniqueness of paths that people can find and have um i, I think and, and i think in our preparation we could show the breadth right the breadth of, of, of what a musician actually does mm-hmm. so in um in the film you worked. You did this incredible show that you ended up touring with with Thorgy Thor, the drag 
queen and this really unique program that you programmed, if I'm correct yes. about that. Yes, yes, I did program it. Um, it was, I did program it. I'm very pleased to have programmed it. It was a really great blend of substantive entertainment in the fullest sense of a Brooklyn drag queen who has honed her craft in, you know, dark bars and bright bars and great audiences and rough audiences and bringing all that expertise of what crafts a show and like, and, and timing, 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 all these different elements so that an audience has no idea what's coming next. And then blending her expertise on violin and viola and cello, because she plays mm -hmm. all three, right? Putting those together with me bringing the academic side and the, oh, you came for Thorgy, but we're also gonna give you LGBTQ history, Canadian LGBTQ, history, um, surprises, a dance, knowledge. So what I think um, what, what I think is is important is for people to come to a concert sometimes and get more than they bargained for, right? And I think with the Thorgy concert, what makes it successful, because we are still touring that concert. Okay. Yeah, we are still touring that concert. At two, I think with two concerts next year? Yeah. Um, almost, I think we've done a lot of, a lot of the orchestras in Canada, not all of them, but you know, eventually we'll get there, um, is that people come for Thorgy and they get so much more, right? And we're always evolving the program because the state of the lives of LGBTQ people are constantly evolving, especially if you live in certain states where, for example, in schools, you're no longer allowed to talk about LGBTQ people, right? That's as of, that's as of last <sighs> week. You can't mention it. You can't say anything. You'll be fine, right? So as states balance um, parents' rights with the existence of LGBTQ, as that situation evolves, uh, so will my show. Mm -hmm. And so will my performances for the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm just sitting with that, you know, that's really, it, it's, it's amazing because it's something that's very entertaining, but it's so deep and so meaningful to bring that that together yeah and it's i think in in a show like that um at the end of the day you know people buy a ticket for a concert and it's trust it's you know maybe it's 25 dollars, maybe it's 250 dollars mm -hmm. of trust saying like i'm i'm asking you to, i'm expecting you to do something with this trust that I've given you, right? And I think when they come to a Thorgy concert, they're trusting us to provide a space where they can be themselves in a space. And I, I don't know, I don't know that concert halls have necessarily been overtly homophobic as much as other spaces, right? Like say like a mm -hmm. hockey, um, what's it called where they get ready? Hockey dressing room or whatever. <laughs> Sorry, mm -hmm. for, I'm not gonna talk about sports because I won't be able to do it. But um, you know, they're trusting us to provide a space where they will be accepted, where their music will be celebrated. The culture of LGBTQ and drag especially is okay and it's cool, right? So I think it's important that we have those spaces for different parts of the community, right? Um, that we have those spaces for people who have heard Beethoven five, 10 times and it's their favorite symphony and they wanna hear it play just absolutely the best we possibly can do it. And people who wanna come and hear, you know, old classics of, modern rock perform with an orchestra because it sounds really fun it's cool they can wear their jeans fantastic space for that space for you know people who are you know they have kids that are on the spectrum and maybe the parents used to love maybe they played in band or they played in youth orchestra and now because their kid needs so much attention they can't because they're worried is my kid gonna vocalize mm -hmm. this concert no we have a space for you as well too maybe it's only twice a year maybe it's only two or three times a year that we can provide that space but we will provide that space we we see you there, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know that every orchestra is going to, like, honestly, I don't know that every orchestra is going to be able to provide for every single aspect of the community, right? Because 8,000 reasons. But at least we can try, mm -hmm. you know? At least we can, at least we can try. Um, we won't be able to be everything to, to all people, but we can, we should start expanding. So you asked a, a, a specific question, and I gave an answer, and then I started just talking, and now I've gone off. So I'm sorry. It's the best kind of conversation, I think. Yes, sir, sir. So what would 12-year-old Daniel have thought to see 
his future self on on stage with a drag queen conducting an orchestra <gasps> and talking about gay rights. <laughs> Twelve year old Daniel would have died a thousand deaths and been absolutely shocked and probably appalled. Um, 12 year old Daniel was very conservative um, and very cautious. I still am pretty conservative and pretty cautious, um, which I think you can detect actually, even in the Thorgy show, mm -hmm. which seems on, on the surface to be <gasps> orchestra and drag quite outlandish. Actually, it's pretty, pretty circumspect. Mm -hmm. um in terms of in terms of like topics that are addressed and the way that we address them the way that you approach them where the the way that you prepare an audience mm -hmm. for um talking about difficult topics and you know thorgy and i spent a lot of time thinking okay we're gonna go to this point how do we sensitively approach this how do we open up the door and how do we take the audience back out you know um in a in a way that is celebratory and leave everybody warm and fuzzy and appreciated right so 12 year old Daniel would have been shocked because 12 year old Daniel wanted to fly 767s for Air Canada, you know, and uh, the older 12 year old Daniel still kind of wants to fly for Air Canada. So it's like, I love commercial aviation. It's a whole other side of me. So, but I would have been pretty shocked. I would have been pretty shocked. Yeah. I thought you wanted to design car interiors. That too. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So planes, trains, and automobiles. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know if it's like this. I, I was listening to Gustavo Jimeno conduct, t rehearse the TSO today, right? Mm -hmm. And he's a really, really wonderful conductor. He's a really wonderful conductor. And I prefer, I love his, I love his concerts and I prefer his rehearsals. I like watching rehearsals more than, more than, more than concerts. Uh, well, eh, 51, 49. Um, just in a few comments he made, it was really apparent that when he makes a comment, like he talked to the timpanist and he said, you know, um, Joe, when you see paintings from this period and you see the timpanist and the way that they're riding horse in their stance, that tells us something about the sound. Where does he have that knowledge from? That's like the, the, the knowledge base is huge and wide and vast, right? So he'll say something in a rehearsal. It's just the tip of uh, not even the triangle, the tip of the pyramid, right? Of what he knows. And I think, in, and Alexander Shelley, I feel is the same in my discussions with him. Um, it's a time to, <laughs> it's a time to listen, and uh, just listen to what he says because he, he knows a lot of a, a lot a lot about a lot of things. And I have a knowledge base as well too. And I haven't been able to really intersect my planes, trains, and automobiles with orchestra yet. <laughs> but it is a real, um, it is a real passion of mine. I'm extremely critical of car interiors and car design. <laughs> I'm extreme, like fiercely opinionated about um, aircraft liveries and air and, and airline branding. <laughs> These are just nerdy, <laughs> nerdy facts. But um, I will die on <laughs> certain issues, things I just feel very strongly about. And design is design is one of them. So we'll see. In season one, I spoke with uh, Jack Everly, who's our principal pops conductor. And I started off with saying, you know, what a unique career he had as a conductor. And he laughed and he said, I think you'll find every conductor has a unique career. <laughs> and actually came up that he wanted to be a set designer. That was his yeah. initial. It's interesting because all of these things, um, I do think it helps. I think it helps an orchestra. I think if you have something, something else, you know, I think as a conductor, Mm -hmm. as a conductor. I think there are conductors, this is actually a quote from Edwin Outwater. He said, the owl is about one thing, the fox is about many things. Oh no, the owl knows one thing, the fox knows many things. And I think as a conductor, I'm definitely a fox type of conductor, whereas mm -hmm. there are many things. And I think Edwin, who's one of my inspirations and friend and a mentor, um, is also a conductor who's about many things when you see him as a music director with Kitchener Waterloo Symphony and just doing the work of a music director as you expect and then also going to san francisco and conducting metallica's uh, s m concert which is this huge concert with you know with symphony orchestra and metallica and like video and it's gonna i, I don't know if it's gonna be on netflix but it's like that level of thing and then also curating 
concerts that have been picked up by like featuring New York Times bestselling authors and taking their interests and marrying that to orchestra, right? Cool. He's about many cool. things. You also have, you know, the specialists that do their one thing and there's room, there's room for both. But uh, for me, it's helpful to have, and I think for the kind of work that I'm doing with community engagement and um, with engagement, just engagement in general and education, it's helpful to be about many things. Mm -hmm. For me, that's my path, so. So the last time I worked with you, we were making a recording and at the, it was really cool. It's this reggae roots thing that's coming out. And I, it would be wonderful if you talked about that because now it's all put, been put together, how that's being used. Well, the story of how it came to be, um, Kelly Rasko, the National Arts Center Orchestra, sent me an email in the summer and said, are you available uh, you know, in September to do an education concert with us? Um, maybe something with hip hop, or I don't know, like what ideas do you have? And I wrote her back and I said, I'm sorry, I'm not available actually during that time, but if you are gonna do something, maybe you could do this. Um, I know the singer in Halifax, uh, she's a really wonderful singer and she could absolutely help you out. And then before Kelly wrote back, I wrote back again and said, and if you are gonna do that concert with her, here's some of the pieces you could do and here's the arrangers. And I suggest like this order, blah, 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 blah. And then she's like, okay, that's too bad. You can't do it. And I said, yeah, no problem. Blah, blah. And then I wrote her back in and said, and if you're going to do those pieces, I actually have two pieces and maybe da, da, da. And then I realized, Daniel, you obviously really want to do this because you keep building the show. So then I said, you know what? Is there a way we could do this? Um, maybe I can be involved. And that's how Reggae Roots was born. From Symphony Nova Scotia, we were put in contact with this wonderful artist called Jamila. And she performed with us first on family shows doing music of Nina Simone. She sang mm -hmm. two songs. And then we did another concert at the Nova Scotia Black Cultural Center. Um, let me, I, I, sorry, we did another show at the, I want to check the name. We did another show uh, together. So we did two shows and then we decided to have a reggae show with her because she is a reggae singer. So we commissioned some charts and got them done and that went online. And she is just a wonderful performer and I wanted to do more with her. And that's kind of how the show began. I thought, you know, this would be great for kids because we will be performing, you know, in terms of variety, we will be doing shows where they are encountering Bach, Beethoven and Brahms and Mozart. Absolutely, and we should do those shows. We should do, that's great music. But there's also for every orchestra, a segment of the population that is pops, right? So we can use an, an educational series that features pop music to educate, you know, kids like once in their life, you know, orchestra also does this, you know, this is also part of what we do. And then also, you know, for the black community, and I won't even say black community, because one of the places where I learned a lot about reggae was Germany, right? I was working, <laughs> at, I was working at camps in Germany. Um, I was working at uh, camps for young people for German kids that wanted to learn English in Germany. And there were two young people there, and I still, I still remember their names. Um, they were so into reggae music and they were telling me about artists that I didn't even know. They had like, this was 10 years ago and they had like vinyl mm -hmm. of reggae. It's, it's, it's a worldwide thing. Why not? Why not? Let's learn about reggae. Let's have some fun, you know? Um, so the admin of National Arts Center, specifically Kelly and Genevieve, had a vision for what this could be, right? And what was really great is that I feel like I went to them with um, a flower, which is the concert, and they turned it into a whole garden. And now young people, not only in Ontario, but all over Canada, will be able to see their music authentically married to the orchestra. And sorry, they will be able to see reggae music authentically married to the orchestra in a way that is um, engaging, we hope, and entertaining and informative and ultimately, um, very engaging. We hope that they'll fall in love with reggae. Because you can, I mean, you can watch as a concert, you can learn, it's it's really great. And Jamila is a wonder. She mm -hmm. is a powerhouse singer, so expressive and a wonderful speaker and an educator, the work she, that she's done on the pedagogical guide. Oh my goodness. So mm -hmm. lucky to have her, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, so I heard it's going out to schools, every school in Canada for free. Yeah, which is great, you know? Yeah. Learn about reggae. I think people will love it. I think people will be very, very happy. You know? mm -hmm. 
So, and I don't know that, um, I don't know that a lot of reggae has been done with orchestra before, right? And I think that it, I think that it's great. It's wonderful to first to learn about, you know, Price and Still and Walker and uh, Montgomery and these black composers that of, of today and yesteryear. Um, and also to treat this music, reggae, as its own performance practice, right? Um, as a style of music that deserves, well, it does deserve study. And we're not, we're not gonna treat it as music that deserves study. It is music that deserves study. So we're going to study it and learn about it, mm -hmm. right? And um, I'm, very, I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud of that, you know? When we did this with Symphony Nova Scotia, uh, an orchestra which punches above its weight, I think, in terms of the diversity of offerings that mm -hmm. it gives you, that it gives to Nova Scotia. Um, there were Jamaican flags that were hung on the uh, on the set, right? And for me, that is it, it, something something I like to talk about in uh, when I'm doing speeches and sessions. Bring yourself to work day. I don't have to just be my German, my Deutsche Selbst. Uh, Deutsche Musik to arbeiten. I can, I can, I have that part of me, right? That you know, the part of me that is an old German man, and I also have the part of me that is Jamaican, and the part of me that is, you know, Trinidadian. And I'm fortunate enough. Uh, I have the privilege as a conductor to be able to express that artistically, right? And I hope that the riches that is in front of me as an or like, you know, every orchestral player contains multitudes, right? And I think we're approaching a time in the orchestral world where it's not just going to be sit down, shut up and play, right? But the musicians will be able to bring more of themselves to the job, hopefully, uh, in different ways. I mean, I'm thinking even of you here, like right now, you know, you're a wonderful musician, wonderful violinist in the National Arts Center Orchestra, and also a gifted and skilled interviewer right yay there's more you know there's more there's more um and again this does not mean that everybody has to be doing media stuff right this does not mean that if you want to be that baroque perf performance practice enthusiast who's like you know finding the the right rosin, like going to italy to find the exact rosin that they used in 60 <laughs> go and do that you know, absolutely, because we need that as well. Um, but it's exciting to think of what can happen when we let go a little bit and allow people to blossom. And um, I, 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 I think it'll be evolutionary, maybe not revolutionary, um, but I, th I think it will be nicely evolutionary. And because I, 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 I love, I love, I do love orchestra, right? Um, yeah. Again, you asked a question and I'm just, I'm somewhere. So I'll let you reel me back in. Yeah, you know, Daniel, I have a lot of, um, a lot of tangents and I'm trying to choose which one. You know, you mentioned Florence Price, whose music is now being played a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think out of this weird pandemic time, we've been able to program a lot of music that we should have programmed before in a lot of different contexts. And it, because we're not so worried about selling tickets, things are online, have, have been online a lot of the time and for different reasons. And actually in one of your radio programs, you talked about how a lot of her music was hidden in some attic in some house. Her music was basically, there was a, a person who was going to buy, buy a property and the house was scheduled to be destroyed. And he went into a side room and saw boxes there and saw music written in a fairly elegant hand. And he looked at it and realized that this was actually, this could be potentially important. And that's, I can't remember the exact pieces and I did know this, but we found some of her music, right? And this, I mean, can you imagine? Mm -hmm. um, you know, she's a wonderful composer and a lot of these composers could have gone further had they had more opportunity to workshop and to hear and to experiment 
and to have their pieces perform more often realize, oh, like the way I voice the horns here doesn't actually work. It could be clearer the way I did in the third movie. I'll do more of that. But they didn't have the full opportunities to blossom and grow. Her music, a lot of her music was lost. And now it's being performed with a lot more regularity. Is this tokenism? Hmm. Hmm. On the one hand, right? Because now, you know, William Grant still, we're all doing his music. Uh, Price, we're doing we're doing her music. Walker, we're doing his music a lot more. And then I think of, um, you know, Julia Perry, her music's been lost. Uh, just a few pieces that we have. Erilyn Wallen, wonderful composer, doing more of her work. Jesse Montgomery is experiencing resurgence, right? There has even, you know, in the whole in the whole notion of, of tokenism in, in, the, in the industry, right? Um, there are not as many performers of color as there are performers who are not of color. So in a sense, I think it will always appear somewhat tokenistic, right. just because there's fewer of us. Where I start to, so I'm like, okay, 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 I understand, okay, okay. Where I start to get nervous is where, when I see orchestras only doing one piece from one composer. Mm -hmm when I see the entire industry doing one piece by one composer, right? Do more research, dig deeper, dig much deeper. Trevor Weston has a lot of great music. Jesse Montgomery has a lot of great music. Um, so I don't think that we're gonna, I think people are aware, basically my sense speaking with, with artists, you know, and, and with orchestra admin, you know, cause I have my fingers in a number of pots. Mm -hmm. We're aware of this. We're aware of this. So let's see where it goes. You know, I think we've we sort of opened up that we've got our foot in the door of actually, you know, listening to like diversifying the composer offer diversifying composer offerings. Let's see over the next two years what our programming across North America looks like. Hopefully we can avoid that tokenism. But I am struck as I look at the lives of still uh Price, Perry, and others the level of chance mm -hmm. and missed opportunity that seems to figure in their stories that what if we had what if we'd missed those pieces mm -hmm. right um th the numbers of missed opportunities um that they had to endure it's it's discouraging it's discouraging so i hope to redress some of that uh sometimes i feel that i you know, should should I have been doing more? Can I be doing more to help to help composers of color, to help, you know, all young composers get their works out there? Because it's really hard, you know? And, I, and I'm not just speaking of, you know, composers of color, but just, you know, um, who are the composers right now that aren't being heard, that have something valuable to add? Mm -hmm. you know, am I just, am I just recycling or am I doing enough work to find those people and those voices? Um, yeah, so I think I do think about that. I do think about that. Mm -hmm. During this pandemic with um, concerts being suddenly canceled and things rescheduled all the time, you've had a lot more time for reflection. And I heard you speak in another um, interview about how at the beginning of the pandemic anyway, you just kind of leaned on your routine to keep you healthy mentally, which I could really, it really resonated with me because that's the kind of person I am. How has it been for you going on now, now as we speak, we're in this Omicron wave with like new. Well, what's interesting is that everything went online, right? And then for me, um, a lot of questions with regards to inclusion and diversity started being mm -hmm. asked. And I'm the chair of the um, inclusion diversity I'm chair, chair, I'm chair of the Equity Committee at Orchestras Canada. And we have a lot of discussions about equity. So people have asked me to have a lot of discussions. So it's been a lot of thinking about equity and a lot of discussing, a lot of speaking. So that has continued. And then as music started coming back, that didn't stop. So that has been added on to, um, that's been added on to the work of being a conductor, which is, it's, which is a big job. And Burnout in the sense of 
there just not being enough of us to talk about this. So mm -hmm. the same people keep on being asked is a real thing is mm -hmm. a real is a real thing. And I've had I, I've, I've had conversations with people in the indigenous community who've talked about this where there's so much happening and they're being asked, 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 asked. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it, can, it can be difficult at times just to keep up. Um, I wonder now though, if, you know, almost coming up on two years after George Floyd, right? That we can shift from talking about diversity, inclusion, equity to showing it more. Do I really need and maybe the answer is yes to this, right? But in addition, in addition to having somebody come in and talk about equity, can we sh can we have demonstrations of equity that themselves serve as the discussion? And that I'm getting kind of performance arty here, but but I think there's a rule in literature that many of us are familiar with: show, don't tell, right? And I think now that's important. And we don't want to be and okay. There's virtue signaling, okay, but if we are approaching things in an organic route, maybe now we're, we can start to see some fruit um, in, in our quest to represent our communities. And I hope that my speaking about inclusion and representation and diversity can switch from why we should have diversity or how to achieve diversity to you know the, the talk that I'd love to give. And I don't think I'll be able to give it for a while is you know, and this this would be <laughs> this is the working title, and this would never actually be the title. But like, okay, we're diverse. Now what? Mm -hmm. You know, and again, you know, don't, that won't be the title. But you know, okay, so now we have a measure of diversity. We're, we're fairly representative. Okay, so now what are we? What are we going to use that towards? What are we going to use that towards? Right. One of my favorite questions to ask is, so what? So what? Right, so it's like, okay, you have these titles, Daniel. So what? So what? What are you doing? What 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 good is that to the community? What good is that to the musicians? What good is that? What what like um? What does it mean? What is the value? What is the value in that? Right, retroactively, retrospectively. So I think that diversity is not an end in itself. The end is representing and being of service and value to as wide a spectrum of Canadians, in the case of the National Arts Centre Orchestra, as possible. So that they can be touched by the gift that we have, right? That's what I think. Yeah. And just to back to my question about in terms of, because you addressed burnout and in terms of taking care of yourself. so. When you're on the podium, I imagine you're in flow much of the time, especially during a performance. Yes. In fact, you mentioned before about rehearsals. I mean, I think it's interesting as a musician because when you're practicing, we go into, you know, we're um, analyzing all the time. It's problem solving. I think it must be the same for conductors. And then mm -hmm. when you get to the performance, you have to let go and get into the music yeah. and whatever happens, happens, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's uh, the rehearsals are often problem solving on the fly. With an audience and then mm -hmm. the, the performances are it's a very very different it's a it's an active problem solving because it's really it's really magical um and people say what's it like conducting an orchestra and i say it's it's exactly what it looks like it looks like it's amazing and fun and crazy and overwhelming and just powerful that's exactly what it is it's on the fly problem solving you know, it's like, okay, oh, I can hear that we're not quite at the tempo. Okay, what am I going to do? Oh, I have to, you know, okay, if I can move the bass drum a little bit. But it, but you're not, you're not thinking. You're just reacting and responding. So you're so in the moment. It's really, it's amazing. I love it. I love it. So when you haven't been able to be on the podium in the last couple of years, what did you use to kind of get into that flow state? Would, like you mentioned playing the cello for fun. Is there other pursuits you do to, you know? Well, yeah, the cello is more... Like cello is more for score. It's more for study and score and for relaxation mm -hmm. for me, and and for fun. Uh, to get into that flow state, that usually, hmm. Let me think. Yeah. So to for anxiety to relieve anxiety, what I do is it's an educational technique. It's called chunking. So if I get on the podium and I feel like I have to be Leonard Bernstein, 
that's overwhelming. So what I will do is um, break things down into chunks, manageable chunks. Okay, what does a conductor? You stand in front of a bunch of people waving a stick, listening and offering your thoughts on the performance. Okay, Daniel, you're nervous. Yes, I'm nervous. Can you stand up? Yes, I can stand up. Okay. Can you walk to the podium? Yes, I can do that. Can you stand up in front of the orchestra? And look, I can do that. Okay, can you just, can you start them? Absolutely. Can you start them and just listen? Yeah, okay, that's your job. Okay, okay. You know, it's because it, it becomes, the, 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 I, the role of the conductor becomes so vaunted and so um, so filled with these ghosts of the past that, you know, these, these usually these men who all but walked on water and were tyrants and could, you know, hear a wrong, a wrong Boeing and call and hire and fire at will. And it's like, oh, I have to be that. No, and I don't, we don't want to be that anymore. Right. Speaking of mental health, you know. Um, so when I break it down to, can I, I, I'm a musician among musicians, right. Can I be helpful to them? They can already play this without me basically. So can I just listen and offer suggestions based on my study to make it better? Okay, yeah, I can do that, right? So making it manageable. Um, and, then it's, and then and that's a different thing from getting into the flow. Fortunately for me, I find that getting into the flow in a concert happens pretty naturally because it's like you said, there's, there's nothing I can do anymore. I just have to go and do it, you know? This is all super interesting, especially about your nerves, because of course you you know don't show them. But actually, I, what I'm curious about is when you can't be on the podium because things have been shut down and you're stuck at home. Th that's what I mean, you know, like in terms of coping, because all the musicians I know, it's been a, a really incredibly hard time. We're all coping in different ways. Yeah. So how am I coping with being at home off the podium? Yeah, because I think honestly, I think a lot of us as performers, we miss that flow state. Because you you know when it works well you feel good you have those feel good chemicals right when you're making great music with people. I was talking to a musician this morning. Mm -hmm. We were talking about how we're all at home, getting into our own heads, and being super nitpicky and um, overthinking everything. How do I get out of that? I've been watching a lot. This is perhaps really nerdy. I've been watching a lot of rehearsals. Mm -hmm. on um, on YouTube, watching orchestral rehearsals and rehearsing along with the conductor, mm -hmm. listening to what they're listening for. Um, and that helps me feel, it's not performing, but that helps me stay in the zone. That's a way of practicing. Getting into that flow state in my own practice, I do, I do find times where I'm, I have to be disciplined about playing for myself and not playing because I'm studying for an orchestra or not studying a piece of music because mm -hmm. I'm going to be performing it with an orchestra, but to let my own soul be fed by the thing that I love, uh, which is music. Every morning I start off with a little bit of piano practice. This is actually something that's, that's um, reg regimented that I start off with. with I start every day musically, musically and creatively. And that takes precedence before anything else my first efforts of the day go to the composer, go to creative stuff. And that's really been helping me to stay in touch with what I love because otherwise, as you know, it just becomes, um, it becomes what everything else. Mm -hmm. So I've been trying to be, be really disciplined about having my own creative time first and prioritizing that at the beginning of every single day. That's wonderful to hear. I'm curious, I talked to a couple of composers in season one and we talked about improvisation because for them it was a big part of of that. Do you improvise as a matter of your practice? That's interesting. I do improvise, but not um, when I played in church, a lot of times what would happen is there just be, you know, whatever, if you have an, a, a religious background, maybe, you know, many different songs, right? So when I was playing in church bands, playing cello, or sometimes a woodwind instrument, very rarely, um, you know, just be like, okay, we're doing Father of Lights. Okay, what's what key? F major. Okay, great. Off we go. And you just know the song, and just be doing very, very basic, not jazz improv, but just like chord improv, a little mm -hmm. melody, a little harmony. Um, I, I do that. I do that a lot. Um, 
and I do, I sing, you know, <laughs> boy, we're going deep here. Uh, I do like to sing harmony quite a lot in my car, uh, road trips. So I do that a lot. I find that really, really relaxing, really, really relaxing. So, but that's not the same, but I, I'm not a jazz improviser, like at, at all, at all. I, I don't mean jazz. It's funny. Whenever I ask this to people, they say, well, I don't do jazz. There's so many different types of improvisation, right? Right. right. And isn't this part of, I think this maybe circles back a little bit to what we said before about, um, you know, professional versus amateur mm -hmm. and how it's hard as an adult. I think this is one of the problems with adult music making is as an adult, we value competence and it's hard for that person who is a professional plumber who knows that they can go into a house, like turn on the tap, listen and know what the problem is and where it is and solve it in 15 minutes and be in and out to pick up a bassoon and not know where to put their thumb on one of like 57 different buttons on a bassoon. That's really hard. So when you, it's funny because you ask that question and my professional musician training shines through. Do you improvise? And immediately I think, I'm not John Coltrane. No, I do not improvise and I'm not good at it. I do have a little, wow, wow. You know, it's not okay to make mistakes. And I think maybe we need to open up um, that improvisatory space where in music making, there is a, a bigger a bigger space for, um, for improvisation. So uh, improvisation and music making in that amateur space. So in an amateur space, I do do improvisation. Funny, and this is interesting, you know, as my career has progressed, the space that that's taken in my life has become smaller mm -hmm. right? and, and, more, and, and more confined to, to, to privacy because I'm not gonna improvise in a space where it can be um, you know, broadcast on YouTube. Right. I, can't, I can't do that anymore. That's okay. That's okay. That's probably how, that's probably how it should be. But uh, are you making me think? <laughs> that's too bad. You know, in season one, I was just, I mean, I, I don't, I've never studied improvisation, but many of my guests, I convinced them to improvise call and response with me as part of their interview. So there's like many bonus episodes in season one where I improvise with a whole bunch of guests as a total newbie, never having, because I felt like I have nothing to lose. I've never really done this, but I was feeling so isolated because we were stuck at, I think we were in like stay at home order for ages when I started this podcast. Yeah. Well, I did want to, I usually like to end um, the end of the conversation with, if you have a few words of advice for young, it could be in aspiring conductors or composers or anybody really in this space. Yeah, if I were to speak to, hmm, what would my advice be to young conductors? My advice to young conductors might be different from um, my advice to other musicians. Mm -hmm. um, I would limit my advice to people trying to pursue professional path as a musician, just because it can be so specific. You know, if you are learning to play the clarinet and you want to be a professional clarinetist, right? That journey, um, apart from very broad strokes, is, I could only speak to it in broad strokes in terms of routines of practice. I would, I, one thing that would be the same for everybody is listen to as much as you possibly can. Have as many different orchestras in your ear as you possibly can, absolutely. Um, that's been helpful. You know, the years that I spent listening to Walter and Klemper and Furt Fengler and, and, you know, pursuing those rabbit holes, pursue your rabbit holes. That's what I would say, actually, maybe pursue your rabbit holes. Um, it's, it's either a song or a, an album by Sufjan Stevens called Enjoy Your Rabbit. <laughs> and I, I, lo I love that title. I don't know what it means, but, you know, enjoy your rabbit holes because those can be, those little minds can be um, the things that sustain you later on in your career. Um, your specific nerdy interests, I believe will be of use and value uh, to the orchestras of the communities that you serve. That'd be one thing. For conductors, uh, I would say study language. If I, were to, if I were to give practical advice, mm -hmm. I'm just gonna, you know, you know gunshot a bunch of, um, scattershot a bunch of practical advice. Learning languages is important. Uh, not just because of the ability to read scores or read books in other languages, but just to be able to think in a different way hmm. and to have a breadth of knowledge that's like not a triangle, but a pyramid. I think that's really important for a conductor. 
I think as a conductor, it's really important to listen. And I mean, listen, capital L, not just listen to music, but listen to people. Because ultimately, what a conductor needs to be able to do the best is listen. Listen to what the orchestra is playing. Listen to what your players uh, are saying in committee meetings. Listen to what the marketing people are saying. Listening to what uh, your community is saying, your community stakeholders. Listening to what the board is saying. Listening to what the donors are saying. Taking all of this in holding it, ruminating with it, comparing, you know, looking at it from different facets and being able to hold everything that is an orchestra and being an art leader in a community and observe it and, and, and being able to have it affect you. And then also having enough of a grounded center of other things like, you know, airline marketing and car design to be able to put it over here mm -hmm. and come back to it. Um, but being able to listen and take things in is ultimately the job of a conductor, being able to listen under pressure and take things in. And you can do that anywhere at any time, really focusing your listening, whether it's people speaking to you or the composer speaking or the orchestra. So for conductors, it would be listen. Yeah. Wow, beautifully expressed. Thank you. Well. I have to thank you for your generosity of time and openness today. It was just an amazing discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Leah. If, is there anything else you'd like to, if there's anything else at all? Oh, Daniel, I have, there's so much we could talk about, but it's okay. I <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, it's great. Yeah.